Uh, thanks for coming out to this session. Uh, my name is Jeremy McCullough, and I'm going to be uh, presenting on doctrine, um, the doctrine project and object persistence. Um, so I guess we'll uh, just get started. Uh, so I flew over from New York. I work with, um, oh, sorry, next slide. Uh, so the, the three topics I want to discuss today are, um, before I even introduce uh, the doctrine project and the, the various ORM um, and ODM projects, I just want to talk a little bit about the design patterns for database abstractions, uh, and then get into uh, what that looks like in Doctrine. Uh, and then also then, towards the end of it, um, if you were led here by the abstract saying that I'm going to talk about other stuff unrelated to ORM, uh, that's going to come towards the end of all the other projects in the Doctrine uh, collective. Uh, so just a little bit about myself, and then I'll get this out of the way. Uh, so I work with uh, these two guys. The guy in the middle is uh, Hannes. He works on PHP.net. And Derek is upstairs giving a MongoDB talk with more people in it, I imagine. Uh, and we work on the MongoDB driver. Um, but aside from this, uh, I also work with all these guys on the Doctrine project. Uh, so it's a pretty big community of uh, contributors. And uh, Marco is here in the front row. I just presented yesterday on Doctrine. So there's, we tend to see each other a few times uh, during the year. And so collectively, we work on uh, all the different Doctrine projects. And just to give a little history of the project itself, um, so I know the ORM only goes back maybe uh, five or six years, but the actual projects itself go back quite a bit further in terms of the, some of the legacy code and some of the uh, contributors working on previous projects. Uh, and so if I just draw a line here, across the, the various pair projects and kind of just draw a, a slice across that. We have the older libraries on the top, and I have fond memories of working with PairDB uh, about 10 years ago. Um, all those extra libraries on top are really just database abstractions. And then when we look at the libraries on the bottom, those are where we have these design patterns come in. So I'm going to start by talking about ZenDB, which is between that and MDB is where the, do the first Doctrine ORM got its roots from. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce um, the ORM uh, 1.x, which has since been retired, and then we'll get into what Doctrine looks like today. Uh, and you see right around with the, the ORM where we, we took a bit of what was in ZenDB, uh, and that's the Zen Framework 1 component, but ZenDB um, and ZF2 is, is a, a direct descendant of that. We basically took that in MDB and turned that into the Doctrine ORM project. Uh, and then from there, when we were creating Doctrine ORM 2, uh, we split things out again into separate uh, components. So we have this database abstraction library on the right, uh, which is in the same spirit of those four libraries in the top left. Uh, and then we have the ORM uh, 2x, uh, which I'll talk about the architecture of that in a bit. Um, but before we get into any of the projects, I want to lay down some of the, the common design patterns. And for any software architecture design patterns, uh, with good reason, uh, things usually come back to Martin Fowler's book on enterprise application architecture. And this came out in 2003, and in, inside you'll find uh, just a, a series of design patterns across all different types of applications, not just databases. Um, going back, looking at like how to do uh, service-oriented programming and things like dependency injection. Uh, so this is a lot of material to be had in this book, but I want to talk about the, the database-specific ones today. Uh, and if you're wondering why we, as PHP developers, we can write code, run it in a browser really quickly, refresh, it's there, why do we need design patterns? Uh, so with very little effort, we can go online and dig up some lovely code examples of how to work with databases in PHP. Uh, and this is, so this is one of the first results that comes up when you look for selecting stuff out of a table, and then inserting it is slightly more horrible uh, on the flip side. And I think we've all at some point written code like this. Um, there's no shame in it. Hopefully we've graduated uh, from it. But if, if you've done anything like this, you probably need design patterns. Uh, so there's a, there's a certainly a way we can step up from this. Uh, so the ones I want to focus on today are uh, Martin Fowler's the design patterns for data source architectures. Uh, and so these are divided up into uh, four different um, things, and there's going to be some other patterns that uh, come into play that we'll mention as we get to them. Uh, but the four, I'm gonna, the ones I'm going to start with are the gateway patterns. And these are these thin abstractions. Uh, one is table-oriented, one is row-oriented. And we're going to start off by seeing this in what ZenDB has. And then we're going to, when we get into Doctrine, we're going to look at active record, which I think is a term that most of us are, have heard, at least heard before. Uh, and then look at Doctrine uh, 2, which implements the data mapper pattern. Uh, so to start off with these gateway patterns, 
Um, if we go to Martin Fowler, I'm going to pull a lot of his uh, concise quotes for, the, for these definitions. They're really, um, I think, helpful for setting the stage here. Uh, so any object that just accesses some external resource. So this isn't necessarily specific to database design. We could have gateways for any part of our application ar um, architecture. Uh, but with the table data gateway, um, this is a gateway design to abstract the, or any of our access to a, to in this case, a relational database or a SQL table. Uh, and so the example here uh, in Zen framework itself is the, the table gateway interface. Uh, and Zend is going to give us a choice between either using table gateway or row gateway, but I'll, I'll focus on tables first. Uh, and so the table gateway, the, the goal here is to abstract uh, just any of the, the table access. Um, so one instance of this service or this class is going to be your interface to working with all rows of the table. Um, so even at that level, we're formulating our mind this is a way to do all the, the CRUD, the create, read, update, delete stuff that we do with database tables. And a visual of what this looks like if we have our data model, um, which I'm not even covering yet, but uh, that's not a component of table data gateway, but it's assumed to it exist. Uh, so we have that on the left in this, in this person class, and then we have the person gateway. And this is any interactions we're doing with the person collection or the person table uh, is going through this class. Um, so this, in our application, might be a, might be a singleton for, um, for all person access. It could be we could have multiple uh, gateways. Um, but everything in our application code, if we think of what our controllers or other services are going to be doing, they're going to be working with this class. Uh, but in PHP, if we go right to the Zen interface, which is pretty helpful because it's a pretty concise class, uh, we just see exactly the, the create, read, update, delete methods there uh, in this uh, curiously named get table method, which I presume returns the table name. Marco can maybe confirm on that. Um, so building on this, we have row data gateway. Uh, and this is just going to be a little bit more uh, fine grain. It's, you could think it's already going to probably do a bit less uh, since uh, this is just our abstraction of working with a single database row. Uh, and this is really the definition is the same, except now we have this one instance that we work with uh, for every uh, database object. So every, every domain model object that we have is correspond to one database row. Uh, so we query the database, we turn things into a person class or a person object. Uh, and what this looks like, um, since the, the row gateway is basically just doing anything, any operations we would do with a row itself, which is really just going to be saving it to the database or updating it or deleting it, uh, that's going to be in, the, in this new row gateway class. Uh, in addition, we still have our data model. And the row gateway, frequently, you'll just see it added on to that, to that data model. So we might have the, if we're using Zen's uh, row gateway interface, we might get back a row from our database, and it will have those, those methods on it. Uh, the one distinction here is that the, um, the class that does the finding out of the, the table for us, that's going to be a separate component. Uh, so we refer to that as the finder, which happens to be a design pattern of its own. And so if we look at the PHP interface for this, um, it's really a fraction of what the table gateway is, um, with good reason. And it's, it's really just the persistence methods here. Uh, and the, the one thing which I mentioned earlier is that you're going to have to, there's going to be some other component that is either a finder or some repository class uh, that gives you back um, your row objects that would have the, these methods on them. Uh, so the problem with the, the gateway methods, they're uh, inherently you might look at this and say, okay, that's good, I'm doing some abstraction, so there's not really a, a problem here. And by and large, I don't think there's a design, um, there's nothing objectionable about the design here. Uh, but the, the basics of it, and this is something even Zen's documentation alludes to, is that in large applications, these can be limiting. They're, they're really just thin abstractions um, over the database or over the table or over the row. Uh, so we're really not taking advantage of um, things like the hydration and the persistence, which is getting our data, um, turning our actual raw database data into models, and then persisting them back. Um, that's not really covered in these design patterns. Uh, additionally, the um, the data model is something that we have to take care of on our own. So aside from the persistence and hydration, we also need to just do the modeling uh, separately. And we'll see with active record and, and data mapper that's, that's not really necessary. So for larger applications, this is, we're going to look for something a little more flexible, um, something that does more, does more for us. And that's going to bring us to the active record pattern. Uh, and so this is, there's, I would say most ORMs in PHP implement active record. Um, off the top of my head, I could, um, at the very least, think of Doctrine and Propel. Um, and there's one that I'm going to cite a code example, which is just called PHP Active Record. Uh, and this goes back uh, a number of years, and by and large, I think the most 
as across like Ruby and Python, you'll see most things implementing uh, this design pattern. Uh, so a active record is the, the concept here is that we have these objects and they're, again, wrapping rows similar to a row gateway pattern. Uh, rows of a database and they're encapsulating all of the business logic as well as all the data. And if you're familiar with uh, David Heinmeier Hansen of uh, Ruby on Rails, this is, uh, he's the, the flagship uh, promoter of, of Active Record. He, did a, he actually did a lot of the diagrams for Martin Fowler's book. Uh, and so Active Record first, I guess, entered popularity in, with Ruby on Rails, uh, which goes back a number of years. And then other projects um, kind of modeled themselves off of that. And so if we look at what Active Record, what the, uh, the, the diagram of it looks like, we have, our, we have our class, the person class now, and that's the place where we're doing um, all of the database persistence uh, from. And what's not being shown here but would be included would also be the repository methods. So if we're accessing, if I want to access a person from the database, I might be using a method, uh, maybe a static method on the person class. Uh, or I could have a separate finder. Uh, but the important thing is, uh, much like uh, row gateway here, the person has ended up with persisting themselves to database and what we're adding here is also person knows how to persist itself to the database. Um, so it's not just the, uh, I'm not just saving myself and using a, the abstracted SQL, there's some actual mapping and hydration and persistence going on here. And the three methods on the bottom that we see are just the, the business logic. So things that are really unrelated to the database access but very important to our, um, the application logic itself. And so this is gonna be sitting on top of our domain model and we think of it as row gateway uh, plus all of the business logic in addition to the, to the mapping and things. And our domain model, um, just to define that, is just really all about, um, sorry, data encapsulation. Um, so for some domain models, uh, usually it's going to be a class, but some, some people get away with using uh, arrays and things. Uh, but the, the other responsibility besides holding data is also to en encapsulate our business logic. So those are all the, the methods, the rules of our application. Uh, this may include things like uh, validation, uh, although typically that can be done in a separate component today. Uh, and it's also responsible for tracking the relationships to other things in our domain. So if we have uh, persons, they might have addresses, they might have uh, products that they purchase, things in their shopping cart, uh, what have you. Uh, so that's all modeled inside the domain model, uh, which by itself has nothing to do with a database necessarily, it's just representing data in our application. Uh, but on top of this, Active Record is gonna add uh, a few things. Um, firstly, there's going to be a factory method to create new objects. Uh, so since our objects have this dependency on the database and it needs to know how to persist itself, how to hydrate itself, uh, they're not gonna be simple uh, PHP objects that we just construct a new one. There's gonna probably be dependencies that we have to inject inside of it. Uh, so in that case, I think a lot of libraries go towards having uh, factory methods. So we'd, we'd go to some, call some function that we expect to return to us an active record entity. And this is where the, the word active comes into play. It's essentially the record is capable of persisting, persisting itself, so it has this active, it has some knowledge of the database um, behind it. Uh, additionally, if we're fetching objects, there's gonna be some hydration involved, and so I, a lot of implementations here goes towards having static methods, because it's the path of least resistance, uh, even for all the, the headaches that um, that might have for testability and things. Uh, and the persistence logic is certainly there as well as the hydration, so the, the record itself is gonna know not only its own data model, but how to transform itself, say, to and from the the raw row record that comes back from the database. Uh, and additionally, if we're, if we're doing the, the, the querying from the active record interface, we're gonna probably collect our common queries here. Uh, so things, methods you would expect to see in a active record implementation would be uh, maybe find all, find with some criteria, find one, find one by a certain field, on uh, things like that. On a person, we might have find one by username, and we'd expect that method to return us a single active record person object. Uh, and then all the basic CRUD methods are gonna be there for saving myself, updating myself, deleting myself, uh, as well as probably the find methods. Uh, and so an example of this in PHP, and I chose not to go with uh, Doctrine 1 here and, and look at PHP Active Record. Uh, so we have doing the four CRUD operations here, and this is using the pattern of where we're gonna have the query methods and the factory methods inside the, the class as static methods. Uh, so we have the, the user class, which is both our Active Record class and then also the our gateway to all the, the methods in the factories. So to create our cells, we have to give the, the fields that we want and we're gonna be getting back this user object that is certainly other things are being added into it other than this, just the name and the state that I'm passing in. So there's the database context and whatever other dependencies are there. Uh, 
Additionally, when I read this back out, I'm, one of the methods I mentioned, we might have find by certain uh, attributes or find by certain criteria. Uh, there might, could be a general find method that just takes an array of, key, of uh, fields and values and combines a where, a where clause for you. Uh, in this case, find by name, I'm gonna get the user back out of the database. And in both cases, the user is gonna be a, a fully cognizant active record object that's capable of saving and, and updating itself. Uh, and so later, if I change the method, and I might be using, um, I would personally suggest using getters and setters here. Uh, but in this case, if they're just public properties, we just alter them, and then once we save ourselves, the essentially the domain model gets persisted to whatever the array representation should be before we ship it off to SQL. And deleting ourselves would be a, a simple operation of just calling delete. Uh, I, I would say the only caveat there is your object still exists, so you should probably stop using it. Uh, so there's a few problems with this, and this takes us to uh, some of the things that uh, we didn't maybe originally set out to fix with Doctrine 2, but uh, came as a result of it. Um, so one clear violation here is the single responsibility principle, um, which if you're not familiar with it is, uh, to sum it up in as few words as possible, it's to do one thing and do it well. Um, so when we look at software, we have, if you have service classes in your application, that are taking in um, many different dependencies. And I guess the, the best example could be like a web controller that um, also ends up sending the email and uh, maybe notifying, starting some uh, gear man jobs in the background, uh, things like that. Um, so the, with single responsibility principle, we'd have separate services to do each of these, these separate things. Um, so we promote, we wanna decouple our, our service from each other and just have them cooperate uh, and just focus on individual tasks. Uh, and from, as far as designing the services, if you're, if you're working with Zen Framework 2 or something like Symfony, and you have uh, a service container or dependency injection working, uh, you're gonna be throwing in, you're gonna be injecting less dependencies because they don't need to do um, as much. So maybe a web controller is, an, is a, um, a poor example because it ne maybe needs to do things like templating and, and rendering. Uh, but if you have a service that is just a responsibility to send emails, um, if that was listening on some event that happens in your application, it knows to go send the email and prepare the email, um, and that's really all it should be doing. Uh, and other, other services can, can do the other business needs for you. Um, so if we look at active record, why, what's, what's the SRP that's being violated here? We have the data model with all the business logic, and we're additionally um, injecting who knows what else, because I didn't even see in the previous example. Um, but when we, we get the user back from the factory, there's some extra stuff in there that we're not seeing that's responsible for working with the database. Um, so we have all the, the hydration, uh, which could be a service on its own. The persistence that goes, takes the data and pushes it to the database could be a, a separate service on its own. Those are all being nestled inside of the, the user object. Uh, so that's being violated, and this is also a problem for testability. Uh, and furthermore, because our domain model now has this hard dependency on database existing, uh, it's gonna be harder to write uh, tests for it without maybe mocking the database or, or using um, just a, a test database, having to have a database there just to test your domain model and, and the other business logic methods there uh, is just gonna be, a, um, I guess, a, a roadblock for, for writing tests. Uh, and then there's also an issue of multi-tenancy, which is writing, having multiple, um, say, multiple applications or multiple databases um, being supported by the same application. Um, so if I go to my active record, I go to my user class and I say find one by name and I get back a user, that user, if it saves itself, is probably gonna go right to just right, update myself or find myself. I'm getting it all from one database. Uh, so what does active record look like if, I'm, if I have a, if I wanna support multiple databases? If I have multiple database connections and they each have separate, um, maybe I have user records in both separate databases. I have one database per client um, in a multi-site application. Uh, so that's certainly an issue, and then um, the thing that was actually a driving force from abandoning the architecture in Doctrine 1 and going to 2 uh, is the issue of scalability and performance. Uh, and so with, um, the case here is if, if models are responsible for persisting themselves, if I had, um, say I was doing a batch import and I had 500 users to create, if I create them all and then I all have to call save on each one of them, how, is that, how are the methods to SQL doing, I would prefer to be doing a batch insertion. Uh, but by default, if, I, if I'm just calling save it, and then PHP goes to the next line and calls save again, or in a for loop, I'm losing the scalability of being able to do these batch operations. And we'll see the, the something that we've hopefully solved uh, reasonably well in Doctrine 2. Uh, 
Uh, and additionally, if we take a step out from SQL and we look at maybe non-SQL databases, which, and there, there's some things for maybe like MongoDB that you have an active record style on top of that. So if we have our domain models and those are responsible for doing the persistence, and I have a, a person or a user object that in turn has maybe an embedded address inside of it, uh, because the data storage layer lets me, lets me embed objects inside other objects. I don't have to break things out. So now I have two different classes. I have maybe an address, address class that's an active record, and I have a user active record, and they're both capable of writing, of persisting themselves, and they actually end up writing over the same collection um, in, different, in different contexts. Uh, so we'll see having, having that at the model layer itself when there isn't necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship between the table or the row uh, with, the, with the, how the domain model stores itself could be an issue. Uh, but for Doctrine 1, the, the big issue was the scalability and performance. Uh, and so if you, um, if you go back and, and maybe you've encountered this using Active Record, but uh, applications where you end up creating lots of, lots of models. And the, the figure that Guillerme, one of our uh, code developers, gave me uh, was back in the Doctrine 1 days when they were running on, on PHP 5.2 at the time. And having an application where the, the norm for maybe the maximum memory for a request might be 128 megs, and that was generous. Um, so having, uh, that essentially gave them the road to have maybe about 10,000 uh, records. Uh, which for many applications, that's, that's well beyond what we would ever need. But it's also a, uh, it's much earlier than uh, we would expect if we had much smaller uh, domain model objects that really just had the fields that are being stored. Uh, and so to go up and pull up an example here, if we go to one of the other, other added complexities of PHP 5.2 is having the lack of garbage collection, which meant that if you, if you were doing batch operations, there, there really was no cleanup happening of the, of the methods. And additionally, all the active record models are inheriting some base, maybe active record entity class. And that's where all the hydration and persistence logic is. Um, so even just doing simple queries and getting back a user object, um, which you're visualizing, oh, it only has six fields, it's pretty lightweight. Uh, there is a lot of, um, I'll say overhead, but it's actually just under, underneath the class invisible to you uh, that is there and is taking up resources. And so the benefits with, with PHP 5.3, in addition to uh, solving this problem with getting garbage collection, uh, which was a boon, uh, one of the patches that uh, Guillerme wrote for 5.3 was a faster SPL object hash uh, function. And so we'll see, and when we go into Data Mapper, with uh, Doctrine 2, we want to be able to track our domain, domain objects um, and be able to identify them uh, throughout the application. And so we need to use object hash to get some unique identifier to them. Because we might have two different objects that both have the same ID, but we want to be guaranteed that there's, um, if, if I'm fetching user one from the database, that there is a single object representing that user at any one time in my application. Uh, so we'll see, we'll talk about why that's important for um, Doctrine 2. Uh, and additionally, one of the, the goofy things that we do, and if you go into the source code and, and see some of the horrors, uh, with 5.3 we got some benefits of the reflection API in letting us uh, violate things that are private and protected, uh, so we can go in and, and do things in there that you really don't want to look at. Uh, but that's, uh, that was all very necessary to being able to do some of the optimizations and, and make it so that you could use plain PHP objects um, with, public and, uh, with uh, protected and private methods and we could still get and access the, the things to persist to the database. Uh, so this brings us to the data mapper pattern. And in PHP, I think the, the primary implementation is gonna be Doctrine ORM uh, version two. Uh, but all the ODMs, uh, which stands for, ob so where ORM is object relational mapper, ODM is object document mapper. And so all of these exist in, uh, all the ODMs were implemented after ORM two uh, was originally started, so we were able to piggyback on the same interfaces, and this gave us um, a project, which I talk about later, called Doctrine Common, which is these common interfaces for the data mapper patterns and other, other things. Uh, and so, I'm actually missing a little thingy there. Okay. So this was, the data mapper pattern was based on, uh, previously before we used it for Doctrine, it was found in, in Hibernate, uh, which is a, a Java ORM. Uh, and so to define this, we have a layer of mappers, uh, and these are just services. And again, in this case, a mapper is not anything database specific. It's, it's just a separate design pattern or something that maps data. So they're responsible for moving uh, the data between our, the objects uh, and the database. And the important thing here is that they're gonna keep them independent from each other and from the mapper itself. So my domain model should not know that there's a mapper. Uh, my database abstraction doesn't need to know that there's a mapper. 
and uh, the mapper obviously knows that the other two exist. Uh, so what this looks like is if we go back and we have the, per the person model again, and it's stripped down so that there's no methods relating to persistence there. And in this case, you could visualize how I can just create a single uh, PHP class to represent this with a few protected properties, uh, some getters and setters, and just my business methods. And so this looks a lot closer probably to the model of if we go back to maybe table gateway interface in Zen ZenDB. And using, whereas ZenDB also provided uh, separate hydration and persistent services, we just had to wire that together. Uh, but our model is really the same. It's just a pure uh, PHP class here. And then we have this person mapper class, and we're obviously going to have to feed it some metadata about how to interpret our domain model and relate it to uh, the SQL database. Uh, but it's that mapper class that's going to be responsible for doing all the persistence. Uh, so this gives us a very good uh, separation of concerns. Uh, and so what we're doing here is we're complementing our domain model without augmenting or adding anything to it. Uh, so we still have the benefit of, whereas with Active Record, if I wanted a thousand objects, uh, each of them had all of the boilerplate underneath for its persistence. In this case, I, might, I would have a single data mapper uh, for a particular class or model and all of the much more lightweight model classes. Uh, additionally, the, the data mapper is what's incorporating all the hydration and persistence logic. And that doesn't mean that this necessarily all has to be in one service. As we'll see in Doctrine 2, we actually break this up into separate hydrators and separate persisters, uh, which we generate. And the, the mapping uh, service that you interact with just calls upon those services. That's just to further segregate things and make the, make the project more testable. Uh, and so this, the data mapper layer is going to be separating memory objects from the database. Uh, and so that gives us that good separation of concerns, which I mentioned. Uh, additionally, since they're going to be separated, my data model does not even need to know that there is a database. Um, and in that case, that's excellent for testability, because now I could write tests that are specific to um, just my business logic without worrying about how do I persist myself through my database? Do I have to mock some data storage layer? Do I have to use temporary tables or things like that? I don't need to do any of that. Uh, and if you know anything about Chris Harchis, uh, the grumpy programmer, testing is very important. Uh, so we want to make sure that we do that. Uh, so an example of what this looks like in PHP, uh, and this I am going to be using, um, this code does come from Doctrine 2. And it's roughly analogous to the PHP active record example that we saw about 15 slides ago. Uh, so here I'm creating a user, and instead of having to use a factory class, I'm just instantiating a new user object. I'm giving it a name, I'm giving it a state, I'm following a best practice here and using getters and setters instead of public properties. And the, the new thing that I'm doing here is I have this manager, which um, we'll talk about exactly what it is, but this is essentially the, the data mapper. Um, it's the, the service that's going to be tracking my entities and then ultimately doing the persistence for me. Uh, so when I say persist, I'm going to give it my user and I'm going to ask it to start tracking, tracking my user to become aware of it. And at that point, it realizes the user is new. I've never seen this before. It doesn't have an identifier. Uh, when I flush, that's essentially, as Margo described it yesterday, everything gets wrapped up and gets sent and flushed down to the database. Uh, analogous also to a, to a commit. Uh, so at that point, it's, the user is already being tracked. It's um, being tracked by this manager. At the point I flush, it knows that it needs to insert it into the database. Uh, when I'm getting things back out, we chose to segregate things and use repository classes to collect all the find methods. And I'll get over what some of the, the interface looks like uh, a bit later, but Suffice it to say, the repositories, uh, there's default ones that Doctrine provides with some basic find methods, but there are also services that you can um, implement yourself and add extra methods to them. Uh, so here I'm just going to be finding it in a very similar way to what we did in the previous example. I'm just using a separate service for it instead of the, the user class. And when I update it, uh, the great thing here is that I can just change my domain model object. I just uh, change John's name here. And then when I flush, there's change tracking going on in the background. We know that this simple PHP object has changed because it happens to be persisted. Uh, even if I didn't call persist, the, if we just forgot about me uh, doing the creation and we picked up at just reading, reading John on the seventh line there, uh, the fact that I got something out of the repository, the object that comes back to me is a managed object. So it's already being tracked for changes. Uh, so in there, it's superfluous for me to have to call uh, persist on it. I would just call persist if I'm creating something new. Uh, and finally, at the end, the deletion is also pretty straightforward. The, we're just always doing things in two steps. We're telling the manager what do I want to do with this object uh, with regards to the persistence, and then I'm saying commit this to the database. And the great part about this is until we call flush, nothing's actually happening with the database. 
So this already, if you're thinking, this gives us a, a way to group operations together to do batch insertions, to do batch deletions, and things like that. And so the data mapper ultimately gives us uh, simpler models, uh, much thinner models that are lighter on memory. Uh, more importantly, they can be plain PHP objects that don't implement, that don't extend anything. Uh, or they can extend some, some base um, object if we, if we want to share behaviors. Uh, we have this manager that handles all the persistence, and we have a repository to hold our queries. Uh, so things are reasonably spread out. And the other benefit here is that the, we have one manager that handles persistence. There's nothing saying we can't have multiple managers. <laughs> and this gives us the ability to have multi-tenancy. So if I have a manager for, um, and hypothetically, database A and database B, I can uh, take a user object and create a user object, persist it with database A um, through its manager and flush it, and then use a second manager, persist another user, and flush that. Uh, what I wouldn't recommend doing is taking the same user object and persisting it in both places uh, because things could get a little confusing. Um, and that's something that actually we've, we've done before using ORM and an, and an ODM side by side using SQL and MongoDB and sending the same object to multiple places. So I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, but the important thing here is with multi-tenancy, we have one domain model, and we can use those, use that domain model, use instances of it with store in different places. And additionally, we get the added benefit of scalability and performance. So I mentioned with Flush, since we're deferring all the operations until that point, uh, we can allow, in, internally, allow the manager to intelligently group things together. Uh, so they can flush many things at once. Uh, additionally, just having lighter models is much more efficient on memory. Uh, and so with the design patterns out of the way, it's gonna bring us to what object persistence in uh, Doctrine 2 um, and the various ODMs looks like. And as I mentioned before, this is based on uh, Hibernate and then also uh, the Java Persistence API, uh, which was um, JSR, uh, I think it's 317, uh, which if you're familiar with PHP Fig, it's really their analogy to PHP Fig. They're obviously a lot farther along than we are. Uh, and I imagine they don't have quite as amusing mailing list discussions. So the architecture behind uh, Doctrine, these are the basic, um, it's the high level classes at play here. And uh, the way to read this chart is the things closer to the top are gonna be more uh, behind the scenes for you. The things that you're gonna mostly act, interact with are gonna be the ones towards the bottom, the object manager, the repository, and the query. And the relationships here are basically a top-down dependency. So the hydrator and the persister, those depend on metadata above it. Uh, the, the, whatever this unit of work, I'll get into what that is, that interacts with the hydrator persisters. Uh, there's an event manager, which is actually just a common uh, service, irrespective of any ORM ODM, uh, just another doctrine project. We use that for all the um, event dispatching. Uh, and then the object manager, which we saw in the code example, uh, this is where our gateway into persistence. Uh, the repository is our, essentially our finder. Uh, and then the query is something that's actually um, not ORM specific, it's uh, originally in like the, the database abstraction layer, it's just a abstract um, interface for doing SQL queries. Or in the ODM relationships, an abstract, uh, maybe a fluent interface for doing queries in MongoDB, uh, or CouchDB, or any of the other uh, supported databases. Uh, so to start with the metadata, the um, most suggested way to uh, proceed, you have the option of using uh, YAML, XML, um, or just a a static PHP method or PHP files to configure it yourself, but uh, annotations are the path of least resistance to get started. And so what we have here is um, we're taking our plain product object here, uh, which doesn't extend anything, so it's that plain PHP object. It has its ID property, it has its uh, name here, there's probably other fields, and let's assume there's getters and setters involved as well. And with the first thing I'm gonna say is that the class itself is an entity. Uh, and so with ORM we use that terminology where an entity is a is a database entity uh, in the relational model. And then when we talk about the ODMs, we, the annotation we use is document for there, it's just a naming convention. And we're also gonna say that um, it's being stored in the products table. Uh, additionally, if there were things like indexes that we might wanna define on the products table, uh, we would do that as well at the, at the class level doc block. Uh, and all this might exist in a separate file if you'd prefer not to, to have the configuration alongside your entities, you could have just an XML file or a YAML file. Uh, now with the ID property, so that's gonna be our, um, correspond to the ID field in the, in the table. We're gonna say that is the identifier. Um, we're gonna say it's a column, we're gonna, we want it to be an integer identifier, and I also want it to be generated. 
uh, and the database abstraction, which is a layer below ORM in the, in the DBAL library, is going to, with generated value, in Postgres, it might use a sequence, and in MySQL, we use an auto-increment column. So that's something that's already abstracted from us that we don't have to worry about. Uh, and likewise, with uh, the name field here, we know that's a string, uh, and that'll, if that gets, when that schema gets created in the database, that'll become a, uh, probably a var car. Uh, and so the, the metadata is giving us the mapping between um, the domain model and then also how it's represented in the database. The hydrator is going to use this to, when we take our response from the database and turn it into our, our classes, which we have on the left here, uh, it's going to be able to make that transformation for us. And on the flip side, we look at the persister, and that's doing the reverse. Uh, so our hydrator is kind of like a, more like a serialization. It's, it's, it can, be a, can afford to be a bit stupider. Uh, the persister has to be a bit more intelligent in how it's grouping the queries together and making more efficient queries. Uh, but the principle is they're essentially working in the opposite directions of each other. And they're complements. Uh, and so they both get used by this unit of work. Um, and there's a bunch of visualizations I could use here. You can think of this as the brain of the uh, ORM or the ODM. Uh, also known as 3,000 lines of taking care of business. Um, it's not quite as exciting as this Jim Belushi film, but it's, uh, it's also pretty, uh, a pretty interesting class file to take a look at. Um, but instead of making sense of 3,000 lines to succinctly define it, it's responsible for one, tracking all the changes, um, taking care, tracking everything that happens in our application, um, all the business logic, and turning that into uh, commits to the database. Um, so this is what's uh, turning all the activity in our application that, that we do or that our, our users do by web requests and uh, making sure that gets stored in the database via the persisters. Uh, and so it's responsible for uh, joining all of the, the right operations together, uh, deciding what needs to be done, certain things are certain changes might be no ops that need no persistence of the database. Uh, and this all, uh, when we decide to call flush, um, this is essentially unit of work decides to commit its um, whatever unsaved changes have to be, happen to exist in memory to com commit those to the database. Uh, and the unit of work to interact with our domain model, it's gonna uh, track our objects by one of four different states. Uh, so the first one is new, and that's uh, probably self-explanatory. That's I don't have a, as a new object, I don't have any persistent identity. I don't have an identifier even. I was just created probably with a new operator. Uh, and once we persist a new object, it becomes managed. And in this case, the manager and thusly unit of work uh, is aware of me and it's tracking my changes. Uh, so when objects are managed, we're tracking, we're tracking objects by their, the PHP's SPL object ID, just so we have a, a unique uh, identifier on the object. We don't want to use the actual identifier itself because if I, if I have the same user um, that I fetched from uh, two different places, I have user with, and they're both actually the same data, but they're actually not the same object in memory, um, I'm not gonna consider them the same. What I wanna do, the reason that we wanna track objects by their um, SPL object cache is because if I have a user object in, in any context, if I have a user representing uh, the John Wage user, and I modify it in any place in my application, I wanna be able to track changes to that database entity in, in one place. Uh, so we don't want to deal with, with copies of multiple objects. Uh, the goal with unit of work is to have a single, um, not to refer to this as a single pattern, but have a single object that represents a given database entity in the memory of the application. Uh, once we decide to delete an object, it'll, it still has to be tracked because until we flush, uh, we need to know that it's kind of pending, pending deletion. So there's a remove state there. Uh, and then lastly, there's a way if we need to um, say, stop tracking everything, uh, objects will become detached. Uh, and that's, uh, for intents and purposes, inside ORM, it's kind of treated the same way as, as new, except there's, with a detached operation, there's, uh, you would never expect to, to persist any changes on a detached thing. You wouldn't expect to, uh, to track it again for the request. Uh, so in PHP, this looks like, if we go back to the old example, uh, I create a new user. At that instant, if I was to it's not even connected to uh, unit of work, but if I was to ask unit of work, what, do you, what is the state of this object? Um, it, it's never seen it before, it's gonna report that it's new. Uh, once I persist it, it becomes managed, and once I say that I wanna remove it, uh, up until the point I flush it, uh, its state is removed. Uh, so the benefit of the identity map, uh, and this actually does a better job of explaining it, um, from a repository, if I'm fetching an object, 
and maybe I'm fetching it by criteria or I'm fetching it by the ident identifier. Once we get the result back from the database, we have to hydrate whatever that result is into a, into a domain model. And at that point, we should have its identifier, um, and we need its identifier to be able to, uh, to have an identity map. Uh, so if I ask um, the repository, which, and the identity map is behind this, if I say I want user one, uh, it's gonna come back to me, and if, if user one has already happens to have been fetched previously, it will just give me back a reference to that. Otherwise, it is gonna go to the database. It's going to fill that back in, in the identity map. And so the second time I request it, I'll be guaranteed to get back the same exact object. And so practically in PHP, this means that if I have um, multiple repositories, maybe in separate functions, uh, separate services in my application, I fetch a user once by its ID uh, or some other criteria, and, uh, but I'm essentially I'm getting back user, user A here has, is identifier one in the database. Uh, in a whole separate context, if I go and fetch maybe through another repository instance, I go and fetch the same user, I'm gonna be guaranteed that both users are not only, they may not be, um, I'm not only checking that they're equivalent, I'm checking that they're absolutely identical. So in PHP, these represent the same objects in memory. And so this guarantees that in multiple places, since user is being persisted, changes anywhere in my application to this object will, the next time I flush, get persisted back um, to ODM. So I'm not left in a state where I have the John Wage user waiting with maybe just a modification to his birthday and another copy of him with just a modification to his uh, home address and they're gonna be saved and maybe one is gonna overwrite the other. Uh, the goal here is to have one object for a given database entity. So this, this brings us over to the object manager because we don't actually, even though unit of work is the brains of the operation, we don't work with it directly, you work with the object manager. And so the different methods that we'll find here are um, a very loose repository method just to find things by their identifier. And the more interesting ones are gonna be in the repository class. Uh, but additionally, this is the place where we're doing the persisting, the removing, the flushing. Uh, and then over on the right, um, things that you probably will use less often uh, and I apologize to, for the word wrapping here. But the, by clearing the object manager, it basically says anyone that you're tracking, anyone that you're managing, uh, just detach everybody. Uh, or detach by a certain class. And the, the, I would say the goals for detaching would be if you, uh, you have an object and you'd like to use it in some other capacity, but you don't want, uh, I don't want any risk that this object is gonna go, like I'm gonna totally destroy John's user. I'm just gonna set him with completely garbage fields and then send it off in an email or something like that. Uh, I don't want any risk that that's going to be, end up being flushed to the database. So I'm just gonna detach it so that um, my object is now, just goes to be, become unmanaged. Uh, at some point I might decide that was a mistake. I would actually like to have this managed again. Uh, so I could use the merge, ob the merge method on object manager to uh, give it an object and tell the object manager I would like to, I would like you to start tracking this again. Uh, the, the one thing to note here is that um, since that time, since I detached John's user, and before I call merge, I might have gone and fetched John user, John's uh, user anew. Um, so I might have this, uh, uh, an authoritative copy in the identity map. So what merge is actually gonna do is, it's taking in uh, an object, it's gonna check it by its, by its identifier field, uh, whatever that may be, and see if it's already in the identity map. If it is, it's going to return me what's in the identity map. Uh, so with merge, um, the object I pass in is not necessarily the managed object after the fact. Um, so typically when you're merging an object, I'll pass in, I'll say user equals object manager merge user. So I'm giving it the user, but I, I'm just basically gonna forget about whatever I passed into it and trust that it's giving me back the managed copy of whatever I'm passing in. Uh, additionally, at some point after destroying John's user, I may decide, I actually, I don't wanna flush this, I'd still like it to be managed. Let me just revert him to whatever was stored in the database and that's what the refresh method does. Uh, so with lifecycle events, there's, even just from the, the various events we can think of just from objects changing state in our application. Uh, so you might wanna take some action when a new user is inserted into your system. So if a new user is created and flushed, I wanna send a welcome email to them. Um, so a great way to do this is using lifecycle events, uh, which uses the event dispatcher component. And with, uh, with most of the ORM and ODMs, uh, we have these basic events at any time something is Anytime an entity is removed, uh, we have a hook for the pre and the post of, of the call for remove. So before it would actually get removed from unit of work, we would dispatch a pre-remove and then afterwards a post-remove. Uh, so we have that for removing, persisting, updating. Uh, loading is when the, the object is uh, first loaded into memory. Uh, on flush would be not a um, entity level event, that would be a, 
kind of a global event. And then likewise with clear, that's when everything is cleared. And we also have things that say when metadata is loaded for our application, uh, when the modeling information is all loaded, uh, we can listen on events like that as well. And if some of the other ODMs have more specific uh, events, like if in, um, in CouchDB there is an event for if there's a conflict uh, with PHPCR, which is a content repository for like CMS documents, uh, there's something there for if documents get moved. Um, so th these are as needed in the context of the, the ORM or the ODM. And so with event notification, basically something happens and we go and dispatch an event to any of the listeners that happen to be listening on that particular event. Uh, so the event names are really just strings. Um, so if there's a pre-remove event, uh, the event code is, is literally just pre-remove. And the things that's happening here is that the, um, these are typically gonna be dispatched from inside unit of work. Um, so in, internally, these are extension points that you can get around behavior before unit of work does something or, or after the fact. Um, these are used to great effect for uh, various uh, doctrine plugins, things like timestampable and um, slug generation um, and things like that. Um, and the goal here is that we can observe changes to our domain objects. Um, additionally, it's gonna be, we're gonna see, look at the interface here for the, what the event manager actually implements. And if you notice here, this is, these are all in the doctrine common namespace. So these are um, shared by both the ORM and the ODM. Uh, so the event manager, there's, there's actually a design pattern. This is something called uh, domain event. And the, the goal here is it's also, it's very segregated because we're, the listeners don't need to know about the event manager. Um, it's the event manager's responsibility to invoke them. Uh, so in this case, when we, uh, inside unit of work, uh, we're gonna dispatch an event by some name and give it some arguments. Um, and the arguments are basically what is the subject of the event, which in the case of like remove or persist, it's gonna be the domain object itself, and there might be additional arguments. Um, but the important thing here is that the, the listeners don't need to know about the event manager or what triggered it. They're just getting, um, either themselves are getting invoked, um, or they could be a closure. They, so it's really just, there's a, there's no, uh, to be a listener, to be a plugin, an event, you can be a completely disconnected uh, service. And you're just, some code above you would register you with the event manager. And the, the other important thing is they're, they're not gonna be notified with the context in which the event occurred other than just the, the subject and any of the arguments. Uh, so they don't necessarily know about unit of work. They don't necessarily know about doctrine. They just know this is our domain model and this is, any other arguments that might have been there. Additionally, there's the object repository, and this implements um, essentially our finder. Uh, and so we have the way to, just like the object manager had that very simple, uh, find an object by its class and its identifier. With object repositories, we typically have one per, per class or model. Um, so we have the find method to just find something by its ID, and this proxies right directly um, to the object manager. Uh, but we also have uh, finding everything or finding by certain criteria. Uh, this is really analogous to uh, the finder that we saw when we were looking at ta uh, table data gateway and row data gateway in active record. Uh, and this is also an extension point for uh, your own query methods. Uh, so by default, if you were to ask for a repository for a domain model, if you haven't specified a custom repository class, Doctrine will just uh, give, you a, give you a default one with just, just these methods. Uh, but you could also have your own class that uh, implements Doctrine's interface uh, or extends its, its base object repository and then adds your additional methods to it. Uh, and typically, if, if I've had find by username, I'm probably just gonna call uh, this find by and I'm really just creating uh, methods that I can get things like autocomplete or just present an API to the rest of my developers if I'm making some shared code for my company. Uh, and typically just use the underlying uh, query things. There's nothing saying you can't add more uh, logic here if you wanted uh, there's an actual repository design pattern for just as a kind of mimics like the full collection of, of uh, entities or documents in your system. Uh, if you wanted to, you could add uh, persistence methods here. I um, usually probably don't need to. You'd use the object manager. But this is just a free form class that you can, can work with. Uh, and lastly, we have the, the query, which is uh, something that uh, goes down to the, the DBEL library. Uh, so the, the goal here is we're abstracting the, the database query API. So if you're working with um, MySQL or uh, MariaDB and then decide you wanna start using uh, Postgres, there's gonna be, there may be sub subtle differences uh, to the SQL or uh, God forbid you go to Microsoft SQL. Uh, there's gonna be things that you don't wanna have to write 
you don't want to have to maintain specific SQL to your, to your database application. Let the abstraction layer handle that for you, and that's where the query comes in. Uh, if you'd rather not write SQL at all, there's uh, fluent interfaces, all method-based, to uh, create expressions and build up criteria in an object-oriented manner. Um, that might be the added benefit there is that you can um, use the query builder to create chunks of a query uh, and then connect it with other pieces uh, instead of concatenating bits of SQL around or um, deciding when to uh, pre you want to concatenate something into a where clause. Maybe you have to prefix it, prefix it with and or or. Uh, with the fluent uh, builder interface, you could just have these, these query objects and, and join expressions together. Uh, additionally, this is where logic for uh, filter classes lives, which is ways to say, um, I want all users in my uh, database. If I run a find method, I want to uh, filter out users that are deactivated. Um, these are just extra features that have been tacked on. Um, and additionally, the, the query is really um, also the, with respect to ORM and ODM, um, in the DBEL library, you wouldn't find this, but in the, uh, we extend the base uh, query abstraction uh, for the ORMs and ODMs, and then we add extra um, criteria for the builder you would have control over, say, uh, hydration into models. So I'm going to issue a query, but I'd actually prefer to get the raw array back uh, in PHP instead of having it be hydrated, uh, maybe for performance reasons. Uh, if I'm uh, getting my objects and I know I want to join uh, prematurely so I could avoid that n plus one issue uh, and get my related documents up front, I could specify uh, fetch modes and, and decide to hydrate those, those documents early or the hydrate the related entities early. Uh, so in PHP, an example of, and this is an ORM, we have a, a query builder object here, and if we're selecting a user uh, from the user database, we basically, the, the original SQL just has counterparts to the, the builder methods themselves. And with the, the where clause here, we're, um, this looks a lot like SQL, but it's actually um, doctrine query language. Um, so we, we do parse and process this because there's extra syntax that's supported. Uh, additionally, we're going to order by it, and then we're going to bind our parameters, so this looks very much like uh, using PDO and prepared statements to that effect. Um, so you're also protected from uh, Bobby drop tables uh, in this situation. Uh, but uh, better than using uh, string concatenation for the where clauses uh, would be to use um, the expression builder. And this is the added benefit that we don't have to do any uh, parsing. Uh, if you're writing your code once and you'd uh, prefer to have it uh, be a bit more performant, uh, we can use expressions to define inequality or define uh, like operators, and this takes you one step away from uh, writing the, the strings. And so these are going to be reusable building blocks that we can combine expressions together and things like that. And then towards the very end, uh, once we have a query builder um, and we've bound some parameters to it, we can, uh, one, we could, even before we bind parameters, we can save these queries uh, and utilize them. We might have a protected method in our repository that returns uh, a builder, um, and then we can just execute it as needed. Um, but after that point, when we're deciding we're ready to use it, from my builder I'll say, give me the query, and then get me the result. Or get me the single result, or get me a scalar result. There's various, essentially, terminator methods that can get us the actual result back. Uh, so the actual D DQL language, uh, this is the grammar for it, uh, which you don't really need to concern yourselves with other than feel sorry for some of the doctrine uh, developers that have to maintain this. Uh, but an example of what it might look like um, so this is a, a query from uh, one of Guillerme's presentations uh, last year, essentially querying for a, a Facebook wall. Uh, and what Doctrine ORM does internally um, is basically uh, has a real lexer, tokenizer, and a parser, and builds an abstract syntax tree for this, and then converts it to the appropriate uh, SQL for your, your database backend. Uh, and so this is very portable, as ugly as it may look, it's very portable for uh, various relational databases. And the, the other benefit here is that we're working with models, not uh, database tables here. So when I'm saying uh, select EA from um, entry A, uh, all these are models in my application, not necessarily database tables. I don't have to worry about what the table is called uh, or what some of the field names might be called. These are all just the, the mapped fields in my application. Uh, so the building upon this, uh, it was important to have perf both performance and some tunability. Um, so things like even like D DQL parsing um, or by parsing this entire uh, string into the abstract syntax tree before we bind the parameters, we want to be able to cache that for performance. Uh, additionally, obviously have things like result caching. Um, caching things like the annotations. We don't have to want to have to read annotations and the metadata for your domain models every time, so we have caching for all this. Uh, 
um, with respect to the unit of work, um, you can imagine if I have a huge application, I have, I'm creating thousands of objects, they're all gonna be managed. I don't want unit of work to have to go inspect them all for changes. Uh, so you have control over change tracking policies. Do you want to uh, manually tell unit of work which, doc which uh, objects that should be inspected? Uh, alternatively, you might want to say, I want to tell unit of work exactly which properties change. So I don't want it to do, have to do any iteration and, and examining everything in my, in PHP's memory. Uh, the default behavior is to, is the path of least resistance, which is just to check everything. Uh, and then you're invited to tune that later if you need to. Uh, additionally, with respect to uh, something that uh, Marco works on, um, pro proxy objects. Uh, so if I'm selecting entities and they have their relations, uh, we're gonna create essentially hollow objects um, to represent those relations up front. So those objects exist, I could chain my get methods together, uh, and this allows us to implement lazy loading. So that proxy object, when it's time, when I access something that's maybe not the identifier field, anything that would require me actually going to the database, at that point the query can be run. Uh, and you also have control with fetch modes is saying that I want those proxy objects to be, rather than having proxy objects and uh, having unanticipated um, queries in my application as I access things. If I have, if I select 20 users and then as I access each of those 20, I go and access get address, that's uh, double the amount of queries. Uh, and so that we refer to as the n plus one problem. So by prefetching things, I can avoid having to, um, I can make it more predictable and, and do all my querying up front before I get into my template or my controller and start accessing the, the results. Uh, and lastly, things like code generation, so hydrators, persisters, these need to exist for performance reasons as PHP classes. Uh, your model's changing, we don't want you to have to write hydrators, persisters, so we're gonna generate these classes for you and cache them. Um, so internally, Doctrine is doing uh, code generation for the services, for the main services that have to work with your model. Uh, and so behind all this persistence layer, and I'll try and get through this in five minutes, um, these are the various packages that exist. Again, with the dependencies, the things at the top are um, depended on by the things toward the bottom. Uh, we were talking about today uh, DBAL and the ORM, uh, which are for relational databases. Uh, there's also, just like DBAL, database abstraction. Uh, there's one for MongoDB and CouchDB. The CouchDB one is actually a client. Uh, and then they each have their own ODMs. And then there's uh, the PHP CR project, if people are familiar with Easy Publish, um, and I think, uh, uh, Drupal may have been considering it, I'm not sure, but there's also a, a Symfony CMF project. Uh, PHP CR is something akin to uh, Java's Jackrabbit uh, API for uh, storing CMS documents. Uh, and so that also has an ODM uh, which they use in their libraries. Uh, all these have a common dependency on uh, Doctrine Common, so aptly named. Uh, that's where things like the event manager uh, live. And that in turn has, we have separate libraries for things like annotation parsing, the lexing, Lexer stuff that happens for DQL parsing, um, uh, the cache interface, uh, collections, and uh, inflection. Uh, and so collections are also, um, you'll get through a number of these, but all of those packages are available in the Doctrine uh, Composer vendor namespace. Uh, so to focus on a few of these, caching, uh, there's various backends, essentially what is the default implementation for caching, things like the query results and, and uh, parse DQL and things like that. Uh, so there's a, a pr at current writing, there's about a dozen different backends ranging from uh, Mongo and Redis to uh, memcache and APC, uh, and even PHP file based. Um, it has things like uh, namespace buckets and uh, versions, so you can increment your cache version, uh, essentially, and kind of forget about everything else of the previous version and just um, go on from there. Uh, there's basically a, a simple four method API of just um, getting things, fetching, uh, seeing if it contains, and, and deleting. Additionally, for annotations, uh, Doctrine's implementation, as I guess, um, not to boast, I suppose it's become the de facto standard for uh, annotation parsing in PHP. There's a few other uh, implementations, but uh, a lot of the large frameworks, Symfony and Zen, are using uh, Doctrine's annotation parser. Um, it also integrates with cache. It, has, it uses lexing because we, our annotations um, can have a complex syntax. It's not just uh, the at symbol and then some string. Um, uh, we could have things like embedded uh, lists inside of them or um, essentially hash tables or dictionaries just like kind of having JSON inside the, the body of an annotation uh, for complex things like defining indexes uh, in our models. And these, this all falls back to parsing what we find in the doc blocks. Uh, and then there's the collection API, uh, which is a great thing to, very easy to pick up and start using on your own. 
so while developing uh, Doctrine 2, there was a need for something better than working with PHP arrays. Um, the core um, SPL array object class wasn't suitable for the needs. Uh, so some of the Doctrine developers created this um, object-oriented collection interface, uh, which I guess what they wish uh, PHP arrays were, or what array object was. Uh, in here, we just have array collection, which is the base implementation. It's an in-memory representation. Uh, ORM is going to take the common interface that this defines and have things like persistent collections. So we have the same API for accessing an array, uh, but now it's a persistent collection, which means we can uh, track changes to the document, because we, if you're working with something like MongoDB and you have an array field with objects inside of it, we want to see when objects are added and removed uh, and be able to get the change tracking out of that. Uh, while still giving you a consistent interface. If I create a new object, I want to work with an array collection. And if I'm getting working with something that's modeled in the database, I want it to have the same API. But it has to be, um, it has to have some change tracking inside of it. So we have uh, a common interface to share. Uh, and this is, there's also newer work being done in having a criteria API, which basically lets us, the same way we have like querying with expressions and matching things, uh, we can uh, create criteria, um, sort of like a query builder, and throw it at a collection and say, filter yourself down to the elements that match this criteria. Uh, similar to, if you think like array underscore filter in PHP, but at a much higher level. Uh, and then there's the, the base abstraction libraries. Uh, there's DBEL, it's a thin layer on top of PDO. Uh, SQL abstraction, it does the type mapping in the query builder. Uh, there's an equivalent one for MongoDB, which I spent a lot of my time working on. It just abstracts uh, our driver. Um, does things, takes care of things like error, automatic retrying queries if there's an error. Uh, and it basically just adds uh, syntactic sugar. Uh, there's not as much of a need as what DBEL does for relational databases since here we're only, we're dealing with one uh, non-relational database. Uh, and there's a bunch of other libraries that I, I touched on, but they, they do exist if you'd like to research them. Uh, we have a running gag with mimicking Java things, so we actually have something that maps XML to, OD, to uh, PHP documents. Uh, I have no idea who actually uh, uses that voluntarily. Um, and then there's also a, another library which Marco talked about yesterday for doing things like database migrations. Um, so these are out there, outside the scope of what I could talk about today, but I invite you to look them up. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, there's a red sign, I'm not kicked off yet, so I'll just end with this. Um, ending with a good quote from Martin Fowler is that the, the ORM essentially can do that 80, 90% of the work, but that's not an excuse to uh, stop, to not understand how the database works. Um, I can't suggest enough uh, if you're interested in like how to use ORM, Doctrine ORM responsibly. Uh, Guillermo Blanco has a presentation easily to Google for, it's called ORMs Don't Kill Your Database, uh, Developers Do. Uh, and it just goes through re responsible use of an ORM. So using an ORM or an ODM is not an excuse for ignorance. Uh, and some resources uh, to follow up on. Uh, everything that we create is under the Doctrine GitHub repository. Uh, we also have a, a website. Um, and JIRA is on there for a lot of bug tracking. Uh, those are graciously hosted by Server Grove. Uh, and then lastly, we also tend to hang out in uh, Freenode quite a bit uh, in either of these two channels, uh, so you can find us there. Uh, thanks, uh, please leave feedback if you get a chance, and I'll stick around down there for any questions. Thanks. <laughs>